We have one other um, microbiome center seminar, and that's next week on Monday as well. And um, uh, and then we're done for the season, except that we'll have a party in the middle of the summer um, to get back together. Um, and it's been a good year. So um, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce you all to Tulani Makalanani, close, um, who is a colleague of ours from the University of Pretoria, where he's been since 2012. And um, Tulani teaches genetics there, including uh, uh, metagenomics. And so he's um, an interesting resource for us here in the Microbiome Center. Many of you may know that the, micro, uh, that the university has an MOU with the University of Victoria to develop uh, collaborations across um, our universities. And so um, I, I'll tell you that uh, in particular, Durrani's group and um, the institute that he works with, which is the Center for Microbial Ecology and Genomics, and there's a number of other centers there um, that are really uh, high level, world class, uh, research organizations. And so there's funding to have students from uh, the, the University of Pretoria to come here to work. We'll have two in our department this year, for example, or for students to go um, and work with them. And so it's a lovely opportunity uh, if you can get it, right? And so uh, Tulani's, gonna, Tulani's gonna talk today about his work in extreme environments, uh, but he's also worked in uh, gut microbiomes and a number of different systems because he's got this expertise in metagenomic analysis. And so right up our alley. Um, and I've had a, a really wonderful weekend hanging out with him and getting to know him even better. So um, I hope you'll have that chance too. So without further ado, Tulani. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm not sure if you hear me, uh, got the mic on. So. Thanks a lot, Kerry. Thanks for the uh, introduction and also for the invitation to come and speak. So I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit about the previous work that I've done and also give you a little bit in terms of my future perspectives of work that we want to uh, work on or the direction that we try to head to. So as Kerry said, I'm from the Center for Microbial Ecology and Genomics. Um, it's not as beautiful as Penn State, but we have about 45 at last count full-time students at the University of Pretoria, a total of about 60,000 students, so it's a big campus, and we also have very large class sizes, so, and I've just had my teaching block where I had to sit in front of 380 people who were not the most responsive people at most times. So with this seminar, I would appreciate you guys stopping me if you've got any questions or any points of uh, clarity that you'd like me to expand. So our center, we've got three academics, Don Cowan, um, Teresa Coutinho, are two other academics within the center. We've got um, at last count about three different research fellows, 12 postdocs, 10 PhDs, um, the numbers are a bit off, and then 10 MSCs as well, and the number of honor students. Honor students is just a year after undergraduate, um, because we've got three year undergraduate programs and a further year of uh, one year honors teaching, where the students get preparation on how to um, start graduate programs. So this is my team. Uh, these are the students that do most of the work. These are the guys that I work directly with. At the moment, most of them are not there. They're in uh, Japan, where they're also receiving uh, training from colleagues there um, on a collaborative project. Um, but whenever I usually see them, it's, they're usually mostly pleasant people, and it's very nice to work with them. <laughs> so uh, CMAC has several areas of interest. So as Carrie said, we work on the microbial ecology, and this is focused more on the microbial ecology of extreme and local environments. We focus on understanding microbial processes, adaptations, and applications. There's a number of different applied projects, and these tend to stem from the work that we do in extreme uh, environments, um, particularly Antarctica. And of course, there are a number of projects I'm not involved in this, looking at bioprospecting of new enzymes, or characterizing stress response genes and thinking about the applications that we can use all of these um, sort of this knowledge that we've acquired from the systems that we work in for broader biotechnology applications. And our, pro our projects 
also touch on different aspects of enzymology, where we look at characterizing the structure, function, and applications um, associated with microbes from different extreme environments. So at the moment, I've got four principal projects that I work on. The first project is focused on looking at the ecology of South African soils. So the diagram that's shown, uh, I was warned that I would do this. <laughs> that's shown here. Um, well, I could easily do this. Point <laughs> uh, shows one of the projects that we're looking at where we're trying to look at how microbial communities vary along a 2,700 kilometer aridity gradient and trying to understand what are the major factors which shape community functionality as you move across these four different systems. So you're moving essentially from arid zones to humid, uh, humid zones and how the, uh, not just the microbiome changes uh, as you transition across this process, but how the functional processes, by function I'm talking about um, different capacity for extracellular enzymatic activities also changes across these systems. So that's one of the projects that we're looking at um, within local environments. We've got a number of projects as well where we're looking at, um, for instance, how different modes or forms of agriculture the transition from conservation agriculture to more industrial agriculture influences the microbiome. And we asking questions related to looking at things as how the antibiotic resistance genes that are present within those uh, systems change depending on the agricultural mode. We've also got projects where you're looking at the effect of lifestyle, diet, and geographic location on the gut microbiome. I want to talk about this project. And uh, we've also, um, as I've mentioned, had work that's looked at Antarctic systems, and there's one at the moment where we're looking at permafrost systems, and also on, on marine environments. And I'll talk a little bit about two um, example projects, just to give you a feel of the type of questions that we ask um, in the last two systems. So you might ask yourself, as a South African, why do we focus on um, polar and marine environments? Well, South Africa, one, has a very strong geographic advantage. Right? We, as you can see from the map, are just directly opposite Antarctica. We, like neighbors, can just hop over there. Um, and South Africa has had a base in Antarctica from very early on, and we've been a signatory member state of what they call the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research. So there's a really strong push within the country, not only just to promote research in Antarctica, but also research in the Southern Ocean. And as a country, I think we see this as one of the ways that we can contribute uh, not only our knowledge, but we can also help solve broader questions related to climate change, um, climate change and the impact of anthropogenic changes on, not on microbial communities, but also answering questions that are of broader uh, ecological significance. So this is the base that we have in Antarctica. I'm told it's, it's, it's a fairly uncomfortable base. I haven't had the opportunity to spend months there. I've worked on the New Zealand side of Antarctica and I'll talk to that uh, in a few uh, minutes. So there's, of course, a very strong scientific justification. The Southern Ocean as a system connects essentially all the world's uh, oceans. Although the Southern Ocean makes up about 20% of total marine environments, it actually is an important source of moisture, of, of, of nutrients, and collect, connects all the different oceans that are shown here. The Southern Ocean has a high degree of endemicity, um, and that's, that's been shown in a number of studies which have focused on understanding macro, the macroecological side of the Southern Ocean, but we've, we know fairly little regarding uh, not just um, the microbiome of these systems, but also how climate change may impact on these systems. And I'll also give a little example about one of the studies that we have started, which tries to address exactly this. So I've talked about how we've got strong government support for fundamental research um, linked to our obligations through the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research. And there's also a move which South Africa has been involved in to establish a microbiome initiative. So in the past year, there's been two meetings. I expect that there'll be a hundred meetings before it actually happens. Um, 
There was one in Canada last year where South Africa and other countries got together and started to put together ideas on how we can work towards having a global microbiome initiative and how each country can be involved and create a global linkage studying the microbiome for, on all aspects of the microbiome, anything from gut-associated microbiomics to soil microbiome. So I don't need to tell you guys here um, why it's difficult to study microorganisms, but I'll just put up some of the reasons here. Apart from the fact that microbial communities are, just by sheer numbers, very numerically abundant, they're quite complica complicated systems because of a number of reasons. One, there's a wide-ranging pervasive horizontal gene transfer, gene loss, and convergent um, evolution, which complicate our efforts to understand the relationship between microbial diversity and, function, and, and functional traits that we derive from microorganisms. So these are constantly changing and evolving systems. So for instance, what you find in one system on one day could essentially be very different um, when you come back to the same system. So for instance, it's, it's like trying to look at the microbiome of soils in uh, State College on Saturday when it's nice and warm and coming back on Monday when the temperature is completely different. So you might get totally different ideas from um, snapshot analysis of those two different time points. So trying to uh, put together these systems and systematically analyze and get you know, decent information regarding the true state of the microbiome is quite complex. And several studies have shown, for instance, um, and I'll put together uh, right here at the bottom, that you know, the trends that we see in terms of heredity and, and, and its impact on the microbiome tend to differ quite a lot on a global scale to a local scale. Because of course the drivers, whether it's in terms of moisture, availability of water, tend to differ across all those scales. So this makes it very difficult, of course, to understand the real state of the microbiome and the relationship between microbial phylogeny and the functional traits that we get from microorganisms. And I've talked to you the fact that environmental co uh, conditions disproportionately shape the microbiome in each of the environments that we may look at. Um, but with polar micro microbes, and not by polar microbes, I include the, 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 the Southern Ocean as a system, you've got tropically very simple ecosystems. The food webs there are unconfounded by the effects of plants and other messy things that might uh, interfere with the patterns that you see. And they offer very good sentinels for understanding the impact of global change on the microbiome and its, in, its associated feedback impacts on not just the microbiome, but of broader ecological significance. So I put this chart here, um, which shows not just the climate, uh, shows the climate predictions for the next 20, uh, uh, for, for the year up to 2100. And these are the IP, IPCC projections in terms of how temperatures are meant to increase over the next um, um, 100 years. So the key thing that's not shown within this chart is that in addition to temperatures increasing, we've got another project which is a, a problem which is possibly a, a more significant threat, and that's the CO2, project, uh, CO2 problem. The increase in carbon dioxide has several major bad consequences uh, for the environment, ocean acidification being one. And we don't understand, for instance, how the accumulation of CO2 going into the oceans might impact on the ability of microorganisms to sequester important biogeochemical cycles. So I put up that, that quote there by one of your favorite uh, secretaries of defense <laughs> that just really summarizes the fact that um, microorganisms and their possible feedbacks on the environment are really one of the known unknowns that uh, we are trying to work on. So I put, uh, uh, I'll talk about a little bit about one, some of the work that I've worked on, uh, some of the studies that I've been involved in, in Antarctic desert soils. So most of you, of course, 
have this image of Antarctica as a continent of ice. And largely this is true, but there are parts of Antarctica which are ice-free for, for significant parts of the year. And these are the McMurdo dry valleys um, that are shown here. So I had an opportunity in 2014 to go down to um, the McMurdo dry valleys through Antarctica, New Zealand. As you can see, that's the South African flag here, that's the US flag there. And these are the major countries that contribute towards understanding um, um, the, the ecology of the McMurdo dry valley systems. And there's a variety of studies that have been ongoing for more than 30 years within this system. And it um, makes me part of the South African that, that we've also contributed to some of these studies. So going down to Antarctica, you know, we were sort of uh, supported by the US, um, the US Army. We flew down on a Hercules 138, uh, uh, one, 130, um, C-130, and landed in Antarctica where the temperature was completely different, mirroring sort of state college temperatures. Um, <laughs> And in there, it was really uh, an amazing place to be in and probably one of those experiences that I'll never experience in my life. Um, and we were hosted there by Antarctica New Zealand at the New Zealand base. And the reason wasn't just to admire the scenery, but we had really important questions that we wanted to ask. So if you look at this, this picture, um, I put it up there because it's, it's nice, but also to show you that the parts of Antarctica that we study uh, ice free for parts of the year. And if you look at it, as I've mentioned before, you've got no plants and you've got no animals. Uh, so it really offers a really wonderful and perfect experimental system. So if you look at these rocks that are at the bottom, when you turn them over, you really see a tropical ecosystem in Antarctica. So these are hypolithic communities and these are communities that I've worked on for more than a decade now. And we've asked a number of different questions, um, but all trying to understand first, how are these organisms or these communities able to circumvent the extreme environmental conditions in Antarctica? We've asked questions related to understanding um, the development of these communities and the successional processes these, that these communities undertake. So there are different types of hypolithic communities. There's, so hypolithic communities that tend to be dominated by cyanobacteria. There's hypolithic communities that tend to be dominated by fungal systems, uh, fungal communities, and there's also moss dominated cyanobacteria. And really one of the first questions that we wanted to ask in terms of moving from characterizing diversity in these systems, we wanted to understand why these communities are so different and what leads to these differences. So in trying to ask this, we know, we, we know, for instance, that you know, from a range of studies that have been done previously, that these communities may offer possible phys physical protection. But we know from the studies that have been done, measuring the microclimatic conditions below the hyperlink, is that the temperature and the relative humidity is actually no different below the hyperlink compared to um, the outside of the hyperlink. We know that there is no, in effect, um, a great extent of temperature buffering, right? The temperatures below the hyperlip tend to also mirror the temperatures in open soil controls directly um, outside the hyperlip. There may be a minor um, difference in terms of the hyperlithic community and the availability of water. And this seems to be one of the, uh, the major factors driving community development in hyperlips. There's obviously a protection, a thermal protection um, uh, uh, in terms of radiation protection that's offered by the substrate of the rock that then allows these communities to develop easily. So this is evidence that we found from previous studies. So we know that these communities are very interesting models because they widely dis uh, distributed across not just cold desert hyperlips, but also hot uh, hyperarid uh, desert systems. Several studies and part of our studies as well, we've explored how community composition differs between hyperlifts in a hot desert compared to hyperlifts in a cold desert. We know, for instance, that Antarctic hyperlifts tend to be uh, dominated by 
uh, cyanobacter bacterial taxa, whereas hot desert hyperlips have an abundance of actinobacteria and other taxa that seem to dominate within these systems. But up until that point, we, know, we knew relatively very little regarding the functional processes in hyperlithic communities and, and the soils that directly su surround the hyperlithic system. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the studies that we've worked on and the results that we've had in terms of these two aspects. And what we know as well is that there's, um, there's some evidence that suggests that hyperlithic communities are important mediators and, and, and contribute significantly to the biogeochemistry of soils within um, hyperarid desert systems. Several studies that have been done in hot deserts, for instance, have shown that the extracellular polysaccharides that are formed within these communities are important for binding the soil together. And that is important in terms of the water management regime within these systems. So one of the key questions that we wanted to ask is using these communities as models. We wanted to find out how will these communities respond to simulated or measured um, a climate change um, uh, a climate change within uh, within a number of years but of course you can't actually do this um, within the system because a hyperlithic community there's been estimates that it takes about a thousand plus years based on isotope measurements for the community to develop and so we've had to have been be quite creative in the way that we are able to ask more or less the same questions, but different. And one of the things that, um, that I'll come to that now, let me not get ahead of myself. And one of the key things that you wanna understand as well, and we're still working on understanding, is looking at how the relationship between the community structure influences the function of not just the soils below the hyperlip, but also the soils in the system as a whole. So we started this when I was still a master's student. And the first question that we, are, we asked is, is there any kind of functional process uh, that actually happens in these communities? Are these communities extinct communities or are they actually functional? And we found that there is evidence that these communities are actually functional. We measured through um, the GC measurements and found that these communities are actually an important input source for nitrogen within Antarctic soils. And you know, uh, at that stage, we also did um, a clone library analysis and measured the community composition of these hyperlips. And we found a high diversity of organisms that are imported nitrogen fixes within these hyperlips. There's extensive nitrogen fixation within these systems. I hope that doesn't mean that it's time to stop. Okay. But someone should tell me if, because uh, I can talk forever. And then um, one of the things that I've, I mentioned previously is that, of course, you can't measure the successional development in hyperlithic communities simply by measuring them over time. But what we thought is that having a look at hyperlithic communities, we see that the first slide that I showed you after the, the Antarctic map is that you have a different diversity of organisms that dominate hyperlithic communities, um, depending on the type of hyperlips. The, the uh, cyanobacterial dominated hyperlips, type one, the, the type two hyperlips, which are dominated by fungi, and the type two, three hyperlips that are dominated by fungi. So part of our thinking is that these communities actually represent different stages in the successional process of how hyperlithic communities develop. And we actually set up this experiment and looked at how we can compare um, the, not just the diversity of hyperlithic communities, but also how the diversity changes across each of these, these hyperlips. And what we found um, without going through all the boring details is that if we were to set up soils as perhaps a non, um, uh, as, as the first stage in the successional process, that you actually see that there's, a com there's evidence that suggests a shift in how the communities develop, where you first find that type one hyperlips uh, represent the end or the, the last stage of the successional process. And the type two hyperlips represent an intermediate successional stage 
um, leading to the apex community, which is formed in the type one, which is the cyanobacteria dominated hyperlytic communities. And we also looked at understanding which macronutrients dri drive the development of the hyperlips. And we did this through testing not just the soil chemistry, but then we, we used redundancy analysis to assess how these communities, um, how the community composition is actually driven. And the interesting thing that we found is that the abundance of sulfur within open soil communities seems to be very, uh, a significant driving factor compared to um, uh, open soil or compared to the different types of hyperlips, which are driven more by uh, nitrogen and ni ni nitrate availability within these systems. So one of the other questions that we wanted to ask is, okay, so we know now that hyperlithic communities seem to develop from soil. We wanted to test whether this is also true for hyperlithic communities that are found at the other temperature extreme. So we set up an experiment in the Nama Desert where we looked at soils directly below the hyperlips and we set up, um, um, uh, um, we can call them controls, but looking at Hyperlithic communities, this is the soil that's directly attached to the hyperlip and the sublithic soil. So we look at soils a few centimeters below the hyperlips and also compare that to the open soil controls. And what you can see from this, this curve here is that there are a significant number of taxa that seem to appear only in hyperlithic communities and are not present within open soils, open soil con controls. So hyperlithic communities are at the bottom and the sublithic controls, uh, sublithic soils um, um, in the middle with the open soils being very different. And what we found is that we sort of showed through these analysis and these studies that hyperlithic communities differentially recruit members of the community from the open soil. Um, uh, and these communities such as, uh, members of these communities such as cyanobacteria then comprise significant portions of the hyperlithic ecosystem. So we've also asked other questions. So the work that we've done in both systems, for instance, showed that cyanobacteria seem to be very important in these uh, systems. And we've looked at uh, using co-occurrence analysis to test, um, to see if we can develop a food web structure or model of how, of, of how uh, nutrient acquisition occurs within these communities. And our evidence sort of shows that cyanobacteria are keystone taxa within hyperlips. And they are the, the keystone taxa that, that, that are extremely important in not only driving community composition, but functionality across the rock soil interface. So to ask again, so we've looked at understanding the, mem the diversity of organisms within these communities. We then wanted to understand, well, across all of these systems, what is the extent of functional processes that occurs within the hyperlithic communities? And we've since done a number of studies that have looked at characterizing using a, a, a metagenomic analysis, the, the extent of functional capacity within hot, and cold desert hyperlithic communities. And we've also found evidence of extensive stress response to use within hyperlithic communities that show that the, the, the capacity for stress response appears to be very different across in hyperlips compared to stress response, stress response capacities across other temperate soil systems. So in this study, we looked at um, we essentially got a number of uh, metagenomes from the hyperlithic communities and contrasted these to available metagenomes from temperate soils and other cold desert systems. And what we found is that hyperlithic communities actually formed a separate cluster within these, within these systems and demonstrate or show evidence of very unique stress response, stress response um, mechanisms that are not found across other systems. We've also shown evidence that um, in terms of uh, a capacity for photoautotrophic processes, hyperlithic communities also show evidence of 
very unique uh, microbial or cordial rhodopsins that are, are present within Antarctic uh, communities. These cordial rhodopsins have been previously shown or found in marine environments and had not uh, been found in terrestrial systems. So we think the reason for this is that um, Antarctic soils are actually under significant marine uh, urine uh, uh, influence and this may be the source of the proteodopsins that are abundant within these systems. So just a, as a summary, what we've shown is that there is, of course, extensive uh, community recruitment of hyperlifts uh, from open soil communities. There's also evidence that um, hyperlift communities may represent different uh, stages of succession with type one uh, hyperlithic communities forming the base of state for the successional development. And we've also shown extensive capacity within the system, showing that these communities are actually functional. And we've shown evidence that they've got a wide capacity, um, which has also been measured um, for nitrogen cycling and stress response mechanisms. And there's other studies, which I haven't talked about here, where we've actually shown that in Antarctic environments, which would expect to be remote and pristine, there's actually a high proportion of stress uh, antibiotic resistance genes that seem to be widely pervasive within these systems and hyperlifts. So I'll talk a little bit about, but I'll skip through this, because I don't know how much time do I have? Half an hour, okay. So, the work that I've done also has, uh, in, the, in the past um, uh, couple of years, has also shifted to understanding the microbial ecology of uh, marine ecosystems. So I've spoke a little bit uh, previously about the work that we do in the Southern Ocean and how the Southern Ocean is actually a key ecosystem um, connecting all the world's oceans. So compared to uh, Atlant the Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Ocean, we know essentially, surprisingly, very little regarding the microbiomes of Southern Ocean communities and functional processes within these systems. This ecosystem is really an important um, um, uh, model system because it actually is a site where over 70% of ocean product productivity and exchange of nutrients occurs. It's really a high productivity ecosystem. So, we know that the uh, Southern Ocean is really important in terms of its uh, ability to sequester carbon. And uh, previous studies have shown that over 40% of anthropogenic CO2 is stored in the Southern Ocean. There's been you know, many decades of work that have looked at understanding what is termed the physical and uh, uh, chemical um, solubility pumps in the Southern Ocean. But we know very little regarding the impact of microbial communities, um, and then specifically the microbial loop, and how it might act as a feedback mechanism uh, influencing both the physical and chemical pump uh, in the Southern Ocean. So of course, ocean environments are highly interconnected and, um, and highly interconnected and uh, connected, uh, that's what I said highly interconnected systems. <laughs> but what we, what, we, what we don't see from this um, um, figure is that there's actually a range of different oceanographic variables um, that influence the way in which water is transported through marine ecosystems. So if you look at the Antarctic system, of course, you've got Antarctic bottom waters, bottom waters that are, um, have an, a, a, a lower temperature. And these Antarctic bottom waters then tend to be transported up to um, the South Atlantic. And what we're trying to understand is in that inter-exchange or transport of nutrients, how do the microbiomes change? And how is the ability of, micro, uh, of the microbiome to, um, to mediate crucial biogeochemical cycles, how that ability also changes? And we, we, we're doing this um, through a number, number of ways. So part of our studies, um, uh, I've talked about how the solubility pump has been um, studied quite extensively in marine environments. What we're trying to understand is looking at the biological pump, 
we're trying to essentially look at the black box, which is currently our understanding of bacteria and archaea within the Southern Ocean, and also increasingly fungi within the Southern Ocean, and how the ability, for instance, to break down the available uh, dissolved organic carbon, how that ability may be impacted through, um, um, through increased ocean acidification and how the microbiomes will change. So the broad objectives are, I put it through here. Um, these are the broad objectives in terms of the um, the total study, not just the the studies that are the study that I'll talk about here. In a sense, what we've started to do is we've first started to provide um, because we know virtually nothing about uh, the microbiomes of the Southern Ocean. So we've started first by um, cataloging, if you'll put it that way, uh, taxonomic diversity within the Southern Ocean. And then we've got other studies where we're trying to practically determine the influence of uh, different environmental factors on the microbiome. And these studies we are doing through replicated um, lab-based mesocosm experiments where we are simulating uh, global change. So I've spoken, for instance, about how um, as oceans start continue to absorb carbon dioxide, how this leads to uh, an increase in the available hydrogen ions in marine environments, leading to acidification. So what we're trying to understand is setting up lab-based and ship-based mesocosms, how these shifts will lead to changes in the microbiomes, and we actually measure the capacity of functional traits within these systems and how that changes with increased levels of ocean acidifications. So the ultimate goal, of course, what we're trying to do is get to a point where we can generate a food web model, where we can understand the role of the microbiome and how it may uh, be related to uh, carbon sequestration across um, um, not just the Southern Ocean, but other marine environments. So the first of these studies within South Africa was based on looking at the Agalas current system, which is one of the largest and fastest uh, Western boundary currents this, that's, that's found within the south of South Africa. So the, 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 this is actually a very interesting uh, um, system because the, the, when we transition um, moving from South Africa, uh, where our ocean, oceanographic uh, voyage goes down to the Prince Edward uh, Islands, you actually cross various systems within that, that, that uh, single cruise. What changes is the availability of nutrients across the system. And you also have a, a number of different water masses that form part of the Agalas current systems. So what we try to understand is transitioning across the system. How would the Agalas current system influence not only the diversity of the microbiome, but how do crucial metabolisms and biogeochemical signatures change um, on transition from, 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 from sort of the, 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 the upper boundary of the Agalas current system to, to um, an area which is less influenced by the Agalas current system? So this is the system that we work in. And what we found is, I'm not going to bore you by going through all of these data, but essentially what we found is that the Agalas current system and um, the waters to the south of uh, South Africa seems to be radically or significantly different from other marine environments. What you find in other marine environments, for instance, you find a dominance of SAR-11 and other marine taxa. These seem to be not present within the Southern Ocean. There are various reasons for this. The Southern Ocean is quite limited in the amount or the availability of trace elements. And so we think that this lack of trace element availability may be influencing the, 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 the microbiomes within this biogeographic region. And what we've also found is that there is also a significant diversity of single-stranded and double-stranded um, um, viruses um, within uh, these marine environments. And what our sort of future studies are doing now, we're trying to understand how the availability or, or the, the diversity of these viruses drive diversification of the microbiomes, so, uh, specifically looking at the diversity of bacteria, archaea, and fungi moving across um, 
the South Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean. So we've also looked at, of course, um, what, what the, the, the factors that drive diversity um, are in each of these uh, oceans. And of course, what we found is that um, the availability of light um, and light-driven light uh, variables that we measured, whether it be um, availability of fluorescence, uh, measured in the availability of fluorescence and oxygen, tend to be important structuring factors um, uh, shaping the, 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 the microbiome across the systems that we looked at. So what we also then tried to do, we ran variation, variation partitioning analysis to try and see, okay, the, the variables that we could measure. Because from the PCA analysis, we saw that actually the amount of variation that we can measure tends to be quite low comparatively. We can only explain about 30% of the variable. And that's shown in the previous slides where we saw, for instance, how uh, oxygen um, levels are moving across the oxygen minimum zone and moving deeper into uh, uh, marine waters, those two variables explain a significant amount of the community composition. But we try to use the variation partitioning analysis to try and look specifically at the significant variables and which of the significant variables are important in explaining the, um, um, the diversity that we find within these systems. And what we found is that the large proportion of the community variation um, is actually through um, unexplained variables and other things that we do not have at the moment capacity to measure. So that actually points to the fact that there is a significant amount in terms of work that needs to be done in terms of understanding how um, the, the marine environment as a system drives community development. And so it makes it very difficult to go on a cruise because, of course, you can't measure each of the, uh, the variables that are out there. And what we've tried to do moving forward is we use more um, uh, mesocosm simulations because that allows us to then zero in on a few variables and try and, ex and, 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 and explain to what extent those variables are able to shape the microbiome. And so what we've also done, but I also won't, won't go through this in great detail, is we've also shown moving down um, uh, the depth stratum in marine environments, we see a different capacity uh, for different biogeochemical cycling uh, genes moving down. We see extensive um, capacity, for instance, in, uh, the in, in the ability to uh, fix nitrogen and carbon in surface waters. This capacity is then significantly diminished in the deep ocean environment. Um, and what we're doing now, we've got a series of um, mesocosm experiments that's just from deep waters, where we're trying to integrate specifically uh, looking at, for instance, how NIFH abundance changes across each of these systems so that we can understand what are the major drivers in terms of carbon that gets inputted into soils and how these may structure the, the microbiome within these systems. So, yeah, just in, in summary, uh, the, the key thing that I'll probably uh, try to, to convey here is that um, our studies that we've done in the Southern Ocean have shown that for instance, what we are able to measure um, in the fluorescence, Mexica, fluorescence maxima is that the availability of oxygen and, 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 and depth tend to be significant structuring factors of the microbiome. And that we see in contrast to other marine environments that the Southern Ocean seems to have a high um, uh, relative abundance of proteobacterial clades um, that seem to also drive most of the biogeochemical cycling capacity that we saw in, in the previous slide. With cyanobacteria having a, a much less diminished uh, um, um, role within these systems compared to other marine environments. So I'll end off here by just talking about what's next. So I've, I've talked about um, sort of our thinking in terms of how we, we see the progression in terms of going from the fundamental studies which look at characterizing the, the microbiome and where we want to end up. Because ideally, in order to get to a point where you understand um, the role of the microbiome and its, its, its um, 
possible feedback mechanisms in carbon sequestration, you actually have to do a lot more integrated studies. And part of this is to use um, uh, what they term metabolomic analysis or multi-omic analysis, where you are not just looking at uh, community functionality or capacity, but you're actually looking at the specific transcriptomes of different genes and how these genes vary across different depths looking at the key metabolites that are produced at each of the different depths and then trying to come up with a, a system where you can integrate all of the uh, all, all of these insights to kind of uh, come to a point where you are starting to provide more mechanistic um, insights regarding what's happening at each of these particular sites so this is just one experiment so i've talked about some of the mesocosm experiments uh, which is the last slide um, where we are doing this more and more in the lab. So I've talked about how we looked at what happened, uh, what happens in uh, deep waters. So when we take, um, uh, when we participate in the cruises that I've uh, mentioned, we collecting more and more water and uh, running more simulated experimental analysis um, on board. This is one of those experiments where we're trying to look at what will happen with increased acidification. So using IPCC um, uh, predictions on what the pH of waters will be in 2100, we set up uh, different mesocosm experiments uh, on, on board and also uh, in the lab, where we tried to mirror these climate, uh, climate predict, uh, uh, projections. And we looked at how the microbiome shifts or changes as a response to uh, um, the acidification that we've sort of impacted on, the, on these communities. And what you can see from um, uh, the co-occurrence analysis that's shown here is that under extremely low pHs, you have a loss in keystone taxa that mediate most of the key uh, ecosystem uh, services. And we actually have shown this uh, through measuring uh, extracellular enzyme, enzymatic activity um, at each of these different pHs. And we've also shown that these, this capacity to degrade key uh, uh, enzymes or significantly changes with shifts in the community um, um, in each of these mesocosm experiments. So with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, first uh, Carolee for the invitation um, to come and speak to you guys. And I want to thank you all for paying attention and listening uh, to this talk. And I also want to thank the different funding bodies that have paid um, for this work and the students, of course, that have done the, the, uh, the work that's sort of described here. So thank you very much. Before we have the question, I, I just want to say that um, Fulani is also organizing the ISMI meeting in yeah. South Africa. I should have said that. Yeah, yeah that's I good said advertising. That the <laughs> and um, uh, he's planning an amazing meeting. He's told me about some of the, just the entertainment as well as the <laughs> uh, that's going to happen. And that'll be in Cape Town next, yeah. next, next year. So, yes, we planned the ISMI meeting. It will be from the 9th to 14th of August, 2020. We've already got like really exceptional um, keynote speakers. We've got Joe Banfield, who's going to be one of the headline speakers, and others that have agreed to come and speak at the meeting. So I think it will be fantastic, and it will be nice to see everyone here uh, in Cape Town, in the backyard, <laughs> attending the ISMI meeting. So, so we've got to see how we can partner with departments to send folks out. Cool. So if uh, if there's uh, any questions or anyone wants to ask a few questions, I'm happy to take questions as well. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, you have cyanobacteria growing under a rock. Yes. So are these all heterotrophs or, or how do they get their light? Yeah, so the, these are quartzworks. So there is uh, some um, light that comes through um, the rock. Uh, but and the, the light, so what, what the light availability that's actually been measured below the hyperlift compared to the open soil is more or less the same. What happens is that there is some attenuation of some of the harsher UV um, that passes through, but the quartz rock does allow uh, light to come through uh, the rock. And yes, and so what we found from previous diversity analyses is that there is a range of different um, 
and or sister signed bacteria that are present within these systems. This is uh, slightly different. So for instance, what you found, you found a lot of Nostoc and Anabina lineages in Antarctic systems, whereas in um, hot desert systems, you tend to have more Cococcidiopsis lineages that dominate across those systems. So one of the things that you're trying to do is, but it's been very difficult to get pure cultures of cyanobacteria. We've tried to actually look at um, getting uh, genomes of the cyanobacteria um, that are found in both systems. At the moment, we could, you know, after like five years, we have a mixed culture which we have sequenced and we're trying to use compositional binning approaches to try and then look at each of the um, cyanobacteria that are present across hot and cold desert systems. I'm wondering about for these uh, mesocosm experiments mm -hmm. you're doing, just to get a sense of how many replicates you have to do in order to be able to make these comparisons and yeah, see yeah. significant results, because I mean, the, the data aren't that cheap. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what we can do for each of them is that we, at minimum, try to have three replicates across each of the uh, different study sites. But I think the major challenge, uh, it's not just having uh, the number of replicates, but we're transporting these in you know, 25 liter uh, bottles. So shipping the water from you know, the Southern Ocean in order to do the, the simulations that you do in the lab, that's actually the most significant challenge because I think looking at uh, from uh, 16S perspective, that's relatively cheap and you can do that easily. But setting up the mesocosm within the lab is, and doing it for sort of that, the, the amount of work, water that we work in, that's more of the challenge I think that we have. So we're thinking about how the oceans mix, mm -hmm. you've got the southern oceans and the central and the middle oceans. Is there a way to you know, add a tracer to this environmental memory to add to the ocean yeah. to see, oh, it's from all the way up here? This is yeah. So how oceanographers do it is that depending on, for instance, if you've got Antarctic bottom water or Red Sea water, there will be a difference in uh, the salinity of each of these water masses. And there's also for Antarctic bottom water, the temperature is significantly different. So that's how they delineate the presence of each of these water masses. So in, in that way, you don't, you don't have, that's, that's the way that's used to sort of delineate across each of the different water masses. But the challenge, I think it's in what you try and what you would really want to do is have a way to, um, follow the transition of each of the water masses and look at the microbial communities in each of those points. Because for instance, what I put up there is that at the moment we have like a shallow just transect, looking at how communities vary across each of the three layers. But it's a lot more complex than that because for instance, if you look at uh, Antarctic bottom waters or the water that's at the deepest point, you have maybe three or four different water masses and the replicates that you have also transition three or four different water masses. So what other people are working on is that they're trying to um, set up our, 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 our ROVs where you could follow essentially the transition of each um, um, water mass. So if you're looking at Antarctic bottom waters, you can set up the ROV to essentially follow the trajectory of those systems. And that maybe might give you a better idea of actually what's happening in each of those water masses. And you can also then link it to whether it's also related to depth or other factors that shape the mark bio. In these extreme environments, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, you know, the, looking at those plant communities, is there you can learn anything in terms of the resilience of them or mm -hmm. the ability of them to help us think about improving agricultural productivity mm -hmm. in areas that we can't go to? Yeah. So it's like a complex question, but one of the things that we've done in order to look at resilience, um, we've also used um, lab-based uh, mesocosm experiments where we, for instance, um, simulate some perturbation and it's been temperature, and then we see how easily communities bounce back from that uh, um, imparted um, variable. So we've done that on Antarctic soils, and we found that uh, there's evidence that shows that Antarctic microbial communities are actually quite resistant and, and resilient to uh, ecosystem changes. Um, I'm not sure if this will be uh, shown really over time, because what we do 
in this, it's, it's a synthetic environment in the sense that you, you put up a perturbation over a 30 day period and you try and look at what shifts that will happen uh, in terms of the communities. But of course, with climate change, it's much more gradual. So within, and it happens over a longer time. So the ability of microorganisms to co-evolve processes to be able to withstand these perturbations, you can't really um, answer well um, in a lab-based simulation experiments. So there's been other studies as well in terms of the agricultural uh, impacts. So we found um, one gene, uh, which is a Lea protein, for instance, that, that's been now well characterized. It was part of a PhD project from another Antarctic program. Uh, and this gene now, um, people are working at uh, seeing whether you, you're able to transform uh, this gene into maize and other systems that are used. And that can then be used, for instance, if there might be significant um, cold weathers and that how this, how, how, how transforming uh, plants with the presence of this gene might help these uh, organisms have better temperature adaptations um, with more extreme weather forecasts. So it's part of that is being, is being done. Yeah. How do you account for in the last story as well, the mm. deposition of material from that forest and that's through the bones and you mm. correct for that or? Yeah, so the difficulty with these is that, of course, they're spot measurements. So we can only, we can measure each of the variables at each of those points, but we don't try and correct for them at each of those systems. What you really wanna do is look at, um, because of, of course, fluorescence will be a major effect. The availability of light is going to drive most biological processes. But what we really wanna want to understand is in addition to light, can we try and zero in on other factors that may actually give us a bit more insight into more important structural factors for community composition? Um, and that is what we're also trying to do, sort of related to the last story I told, in terms of setting up in situ mesocosm experiments where we can directly look at specific changes. One of the experiments that we're running um, in the next cruises is that we, uh, the Southern Ocean, as I mentioned, is limited in trace elements. So we are gonna run a fertilization experiment that's looking at specifically iron and how uh, iron uptake and usage, um, through iron uptake and usage over time, you, whether you can see specific uh, microbial communities change um, as a direct input of iron within the system and what that does in terms of biogeochemical cycling and the capacity across uh, each of those systems. But of course, it's again, it's gonna be a mesocosm experiment and it doesn't necessarily mean that's actually what's happening in the system. But I think they're quite important in giving us some insights, for instance, if you look at the dominant communities, at, what, um, at how anthropogenic uh, changes might impact on those microbiomes. You know, sorry. go ahead. <laughs> Do you know if there's a difference in the type or quality of, like, let's say, carbon in your study area versus the tropical waters? And to that, yeah, so we haven't measured dissolving organic carbon um, or dissolved organic carbon. But that is something that's very key because, of course, looking at uh, the type of car carbon within the system, I mean, we can more or less explain, for instance, why we see a different capacity of biogeochemical cycling genes across each of those systems. So they, 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 they are efforts now, I know they're doing it particularly for the ice work, um, setting up sediment traps and looking at how uh, sort of moving from the surface to the bottom where you have, you have different uh, types of carbon how that uh, leads to different microbiomes in each of those uh, systems. We haven't done it, but it's, it's something that is interesting and would like to do. Yeah. I was curious about your comment about the viruses um, contributing to genetic diversity. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, how would you compare the influence of viruses, how, how they contribute to genetic diversity across different ecosystems or environments? And if you think that viruses are a key driver in that system, like Yeah, so this is really not from um, our work, but lots of other studies where people have looked at, for instance, how um, 
through lysogeny, viruses are key in terms of making carbon available across the system. So um, we think because uh, of the limitation in the amount of trace elements that are available within the system, um, and looking at each of the diversity patterns that you see across each of those sites, you see what we find from our data, there's really a high diversity of viruses, higher in terms of, oh, because we haven't quantitatively measured it, but at least just in superficially looking at diversity of double-stranded and single-stranded viruses, we're seeing quite a lot of diversity in what you see in the Southern Ocean compared to other systems. So we've got, um, we've got, we've got um, two projects now that are specifically looking at uh, viruses across coastal systems and the Southern Ocean. And what we're trying to do is look at actually measuring just the, the viral fraction and looking at key uh, uh, microbial community uh, um, size fractions, for instance, looking at diversity and mirroring that to the diversity of viruses that we get in each of those points. And through that, we can, I think, get an idea in terms of the diversity in each of those different points and how it varies over time. So, yeah. cool. Oh, Carol. had one. Okay, just one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, who is uh, Dry Valley Rock? Mm -hmm. There needs to be a succession of anaerobic um, microbes um, in the lower levels of mm -hmm. uh, and the cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. Have you characterized any of these anaerobic So we haven't. So by anaerobic, are you referring specifically to permafrost systems? Uh, well, no, those systems that you showed. Yeah, just directly below the hyperlapse, so the soils. So we have characterized this, the soil that's directly below the hyperlapse and the soil that's adjacent to uh, the hyperlapse. So what we find is that I mean, both systems, there isn't really much in terms of a difference between the diversity of organisms that you find in each of those systems. Um, we've got project now where we're looking at permafrost systems. Uh, which would have more of a diversity for anaerobic uh, systems and seeing how that uh, permafrost system changes as a result of um, um, sort of simulating climate change from warming and how those microbiomes change compared to open soil systems that would be further on. But it's, it's really difficult to do because at the moment what we have is one permafrost core and we've, we've done some simulated uh, warming and what we're looking at is not just the diversity, but also looking at the key different metabolites and how they change in each of those systems. So, and, and hopefully that gives us a little bit of a better idea um, of, of the, yeah, the functional processes, not just below the hyperlus, but within sort of driving soils, soil systems. So the question I had yeah. was related to two things you said. You were talking about um, the proteoprodopsin mm -hmm. being found. Um, and that that was surprising mm -hmm. because they've been previously found in the marine system. Yeah. And then you said, well, maybe there's this influence of the mm -hmm. marine system. Mm -hmm. We know that microbes are taken up into the atmosphere mm -hmm. and deposited. Mm -hmm. And so then, then you said something else about um, working in these pristine systems mm -hmm. where you found antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So, I, and it's a it's a common issue we have anytime we sample. Mm -hmm. Is how do you know it's a pristine system? Yeah, yeah. And then do you do you really think that then there is this marine depositing mm -hmm. and that's part of what the pristine system mm -hmm. is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean that's there's actually since um, the work I talked about, there's been a recent paper about a month ago that came out showing uh, a um, aerobiology, I don't know if that's what they call it, across Antarctic systems. And what they actually found is that how sort of air transport happens is that it's actually quite limited in, the, in, the, in Antarctica compared to other systems, but there is evidence that um, 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 micro microbial communities do get uh, uh, transported by, uh, across the seawaters that are around Antarctica. So one of the theories is that the Ross, the Ross uh, seawater um, tends to be a huge deposit of diversity within um, Antarctic soils. Um, and this is really more by inference because, for instance, there's a high diversity of uh, marine bacteria within these soils that aren't, isn't seen across other soil systems. 
The question of contamination, uh, that's always going to be an issue because one, uh, in the paper, uh, that's one of the qu questions reviewers ask for. So you can't, you can't really say uh, that they're totally pristine, but it's relatively pristine. So the area that we studied, for instance, there, there had been no, it's one of the aspects, so it's an ecologically protected zone, so people can't, no one can just sort of walk in there and we've got permission to go across there and take samples. But you could very well argue that I mean, our presence within that system um, is, what, is what sort of in, 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 uh, sort of left the signatures. But what we did try and do as well, we looked at common signatures that would be associated with um, sort of human uh, um, people and tried to subtract those signatures from uh, the data that we have in the metagene. So you can try and do it that way, but I think if um, you, you can't completely say that uh, you didn't introduce all of these um, uh, genes just moving across the system or just by sharing being the answer. So, yeah. so with that, I think we'll thank you. And I'll just say that we have space for lunch if someone would like to join us that hadn't signed up earlier. So let's thank you. Thank you.